There are some really bad movies out there. They're not good. <laughs> they are not. Some people like to pick apart every little flaw of a film, while others use their forum to prove to everyone that'll listen just how much they know about movies in general. Mm. Every movie takes a beating by somebody with an opinion and a keyboard, but some take way more than their share of those beatings. Make no mistake, nobody is going to call the following movies misunderstood masterpieces, except maybe me. But here's the thing, they aren't supposed to be. Sometimes a movie should just be dumb, fun, a popcorn flick, or maybe a simple sweet story about individuals living their lives. You know, slice of life. If you're looking for some entertainment on a boring day, you could do a lot worse than giving these movies a chance. I'm Mike with OK Thank You. And I'm Tristan with OK Thank You. And, and these here are, are movies. Well, I was going to say here are bad movies that really aren't. That works too. It's not easy to break into the music business, but these three guys. What's your secret code? I can't tell you my code. Just found a way. You guys are a unsigned band, and you broke into the radio station to get your demo played on the air? Airheads. This movie was badly reviewed and only made around $6 million domestically on an $11 million budget. That's not good. No. The story of a desperate pre-grunge hair metal band who take over a radio station to get airplay and end up starting a revolution just didn't hit with audiences at the box office. But like so many other movies, it has since become a sort of cult classic. Brendan Fraser, at the peak of his popularity, starred along with pre-fame Adam Sandler and mm -hmm. Steve Buscemi. Wow, I didn't know there was pre-fame Adam Sandler. Uh, they star as the Lone Rangers. Yes, they pluralized Lone Ranger. A band working through crappy, boring lives and dreaming of fame. Aren't we all? Frazier is great as Chaz Darby, and he brings a ton of heart to what really could have been a tired, formulaic, throwaway comedy. It's a middle finger to the establishment that gives a sense of empowerment to those who feel ignored and helpless. And really, who doesn't like that type of story? They used to play it again and again and again on Comedy Central. You've seen it then. I have. I've I haven't seen, seen that one. I've only seen one of these movies. I'll let you guys know that now. Should we let them guess? I mean, sure. Are you going to say? <laughs> yeah, I'll get really excited when we get to it. Oh, well then don't guess because it won't matter. No, it won't. Oliver Trinke was on his way to the top till everything changed. Oh. A story about the challenges that face us. Daddy loved his old life and he's missed it every day since he's been gone. And discovering the things that matter most. Jersey Girl. Kevin Smith isn't known for romantic comedies. In the early 2000s, Smith was looking to break away from his View askew universe movies and move into stories that were a bit more mainstream. Clearly he succeeded. Mm. <laughs> As he then had a young daughter, Smith wrote his ode to fatherhood called Jersey Girl. It's the story of a... Cool. It's the story of a work-obsessed advertising exec who falls for a beautiful Latino woman. A few months into their relationship, she discovers she's pregnant. He neglects her and focuses on his job, but tears himself away to be present for the birth of their child. When she dies during childbirth, he has to learn to deal with his grief and raise his daughter. It's a slightly autobiographical story about how Smith himself learned to be a father and its effects on his life. The cast, which includes Ben Affleck, Liv Tyler, Jennifer Lopez, George Carlin, who I didn't know actually had an acting career, and Will Smith, give really good performances. And Smith handles a different type of story well. So, what went wrong? Lopez and Affleck were tabloid fodder at the time, and upon the film's eventual release, people were just sick of them. Oh. Nobody cared about seeing them play an on-screen couple, and Jersey Girl suffered because of it. Smith's fans really wanted more Jane Silent Bob, and add to that critics who can't stand Smith or his movies in the first place, and it spelled doom. But give Jersey Girl a chance sometime. You won't be sorry. Seems really shallow on people's part. Yeah, well. When you put it that way. I saw it uh, in a 
what do you call it? Bef like two weeks in advance? Advanced screening? I saw an advanced screening of this. Yeah. West Shore Plaza, AMC in Tampa. Did you enjoy it? I did. I liked it. I liked the trailer when I was putting that together. <laughs> with the wrong pussycat. My bad. Josie and the Pussycats. Josie and the Pussycats. An all-girl pop punk band. A great soundtrack. A spoof on boy bands. An incredibly smart script. Great inside jokes and Easter eggs. A cast of 2000s who's who, like Rachel Lee Cook, Parker Posey, Rosario Dawson, Seth Green, Alan Cumming, Donald Faison, and Brecken Meyer. I know some of them. An MTV conspiracy theory. Tara Reid, not really playing Tara Reid, but still kind of playing the best version of Tara Reid. Josie and the Pussycats is a lost and forgotten gem of a film. The heart of the movie comes from the women in the band and their friendship. Josie, Val, and Melody get found in the most ridiculous way by Wyatt, a music A&R rep for an evil record company. Ooh. Things move at an absurd pace, which is pointed out by the band in dialogue, and become the biggest band in the world in about a week. Is that a crazy premise? Yes. Yes, it is. Neat. Do the makers of the movie understand this? Yes, they do. Is it handled in a fun way? Absolutely. That's part of its charm. Huh, I was hoping so. This movie is, at times, silly, but always fun. The love interest subplot is unnecessary, but in no way kills the flow. Josie is a self-aware dig at how corporations hijack pipe pop culture, pipe culture, pop culture, and play on insecurities of youth to create brand recognition and sway loyalties. There are over 70 different product placements in the movie, and they are all important to the underlying theme. Wow, I gotta watch this movie. This is what makes the movie smart and fun to watch. I haven't seen this one either. Back off, Casablanca. It sounds like there's a new fantastic movie in town. <laughs> I did watch the cartoon back in the day. You mean, no, wait, not the... We were you going to say Jabberjaw? I was going to say the Cheetah Girls. <laughs> also, I didn't know if it was Josie or Jose at first. Jose and the Pussycats. I'd watch that. Jose and the Pussygatos. Nice. What the hell are you? Venom. Hell yes. Tom Hardy may have been the only one who understood that Venom was nothing more than a buddy cop action movie. I mean, come on. It's a movie about an alien symbiote that, or sorry, symbiote? Don't of they mispronounce course. that? In, in the trailer they In did. the trailer they mispronounce it. Symbiote that eats humans bonding with a journalist who always finds himself in trouble. It's a movie about a Spider-Man villain who is also sometimes a hero and Spider-Man doesn't appear. Nor is even mentioned in the entire thing. Fantastic, right? Anyone, <laughs> anyone who tries to take this movie even remotely seriously is absolutely missing the point. Venom is a pure popcorn flick with its long, slimy tongue planted firmly in its toothy split cheek. That is disgusting. That's why it's great. Guys, can you guess which of these movies I've actually seen? Josie and the Pussycats. Jose and the Pussycats? Hell yeah, it's one of my favorites. But Venom, let's talk about Venom. It's got everything. Corny dialogue. Check. It doesn't have Spider-Man. Oh, snap. It doesn't have everything. Okay, well, it's got most things. Corny dialogue. <laughs> Check. Gratuitous comic PG-13 violence. Check. Crabby CGI. Check. Every cast member playing it for heavy drama except the main star? Check, check. Two alien symbiotes who fight each other and look like a couple of handfuls of homemade slime stuck to a kid's hands when they do? Check. Not sure who wanted that in the first place? Gross. Whatever. A guy taking off his clothes and climbing into an aquarium to cool off and eat live lobsters? Checkity checkaroo. It I doesn't actually say checkity checkaroo. That's what I look for in movies. I got a little carried away. Sometimes a movie just needs to be something you watch to forget about life for a while, and this one is perfect for doing just that. You know, they said life that the, for a while. Oh, sorry, Alanis Morissette. They said that the next uh, movie might have a better screenplay, and I will be furious if that's the case. <laughs> Don't you dare make the sequel a good movie. I will be pissed. Venom was so much fun. 
I saw it on my flight to Singapore. That's correct. That's one of like the 80 movies I watched on that 17 and a half hour flight. No, nah, it's a 2019 movie, not an 80s movie. No. Oh. Thanks. That was dumb. <laughs> Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. You take a bunch of the Beatles' greatest songs, add a mix of some of the most popular recording artists of the late 70s, sprinkle in a few of old Hollywood's best variety personalities, use that more than once, and give it the grand spectacle of history's greatest musicals. That gives you the recipe for a major theatrical hit. Or it should have been. <laughs> The thing is, the late 70s was the height of disco's popularity. The fashions were sort of lame, and for some reason, shiny, and none of the pop stars could actually, you know, act. They still can't. Here's the story, and you're gonna need to stay with me here. In the town of Heartland, USA, is a museum holding the legendary instruments of the beloved Sgt. Pepper, who traveled the world during world wars and difficult times, bringing peace and joy to everyone he played for. Believed to be magical, the instruments are stolen by Mean Mr. Mustard, who is under the orders of the future villain band to distribute them to the band's underlings so they can use the instrument's power to take over the world. Of course. The new version of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, a rock group consisting of Billy Shears and the Henderson Brothers, who have just been signed by BD Records and become the biggest band in the world, go on a quest, along with Billy's girlfriend at Strawberry Fields, to bring the instruments back before Heartland is destroyed. There are almost no spoken lines in this movie, and that's probably for the best. <laughs> it's a tacky, silly, ridiculous film, but it's also so much fun. It is definitely a movie for you to shut your brain off and enjoy. To give you a better idea of what to expect, think of a family-friendly Rocky Horror Picture Show mm. with music by the Beatles. Just relax and don't think about it too much. Although one of the things that I look for in a script is a good screenplay, so I'm not sure how the <laughs> lack of dialogue will do. Uh, I'm going to get uh, chewed up for that. I do not like Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, yeah Rocky Horror Don't Picture like Show, it. my first experience w of it uh, with it was actually this past year. Same. And I went to a, uh, I went to a live performance of it. I went to one of those ones where they show the movie. It wasn't the performance wasn't live. Oh, that is it. That's how pretty much all of them do oh, I thought you meant you saw an actual live performance. No, like they they, they have the movie in the background, okay. so but I, they're yeah, acting okay. it out like as oh, it Oh, no, I didn't see that. No, no, oh. no. Everyone was just watching the movie. Oh, no. But no. they did. They passed out all the stuff that you're supposed to do. I I didn't like that it. That is the I, most cult classic movie I've ever seen. That is a true cult. Dude, Holy crap. Do not like that movie. Also, I know a cat named Sgt. Peppers. Oh. He starred in the uh, It parody that I was a part of. Fantastic. I played uh, Bev. Is it Alex's cat? No. Uh, Lucina? I thought maybe he had another one. Yeah. Hey, boys. Mind if I join the gang? some way that we can prove that we actually belong in the gang. And now it's up to Shaggy and Scooby to save us all. We're gonna die! Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. Zoinks! The first live action Scooby-Doo movie was okay. It had its fun moments and was a cute attempt at trying to bring the cartoon to life. The problem was it strayed from the traditional Scooby-Doo format and we certainly didn't need Scrappy-Doo at all. Even in live action, everyone still hates Scrappy. But the second try fixed all that. The second one was a true Scooby-Doo adventure. There was a mystery to solve, fun monsters from the past, booby traps, and Scooby and Shaggy in costumes that fool no one. Many people dismissed this movie, and there was never another sequel after, but this one holds up well if you're a fan in the first place. While Freddie Prince Jr. was a passable Fred, Sarah Michelle Gellar channeled her Buffy reputation perfectly as an ass-kicking Daphne. Linda Cardellini was perfect, and Matthew Lillard is Shaggy. Mm -hmm. Ultra Instinct Shaggy, though. How about him? Seriously, he should have won awards. Many, many <laughs> awards. It's weird after seeing him in Scream, though. In fact, because of his work in these films, Lillard has been the voice of Shaggy in the cartoons for years. 
Except they until didn't bother now. to tell him that they were getting a movie. Yeah. He didn't know about that until the trailer dropped. Uh, yeah, that still, still hurts. Rot, bro! My favorite Scooby-Doo character of all time, Red Herring. He appeared out of nowhere. Hello, two people! Are you in trouble and in need of my help? Thank you. No, no. I'm coming over there. Stay there. You need my help! Oh, no! Oh, what is he doing? Now, he just won't go away. Holy man. In the mid-90s, Eddie Murphy was in a bit of a career lull. He was transitioning from an R-rated box-off juggernaut in hits like Beverly Hills Cop and Coming to America to a more family-friendly star in films like The Nutty Professor and voice acting in Shrek and Mulan. He's done a string of films with diminishing box office returns, and his output could be kindly described as hit and miss. I actually didn't know there was a time where he was like an R-rated juggernaut. <laughs> you should see his stand-up. <laughs> it was during this time he starred in the movie Holy Man. Holy Man? <laughs> Murphy plays a wandering, mysterious stranger named G, who is on a personal spiritual journey. He winds up in Miami, of course, and gets involved with a shopping network producer who decides to put him on TV. That happens to us all. <laughs> Doesn't it? Murphy himself described the holy man as a disaster. <laughs> but what could be attributed to its death at the box office as opposed to quality? Although some of the situations that get him on screen are a bit contrived and a few of the sight gags fall flat, this movie comes to life in the quiet moments. Aww. It's not often that Murphy plays a subdued character, but here he does so with ease, and it works really well with the stressed out, on edge, untrusting producer played by Jeff Goldblum, who seems to be playing the opposite of Jeff Goldblum. Holy Man looks at the emptiness found in mass consumerism, in the age of information manipulation. The film's ultimate message of finding peace with yourself and your place in the world is more relevant today than it was in 1998. Kung Fu Panda. Chances are, people viewing it now with the benefit of hindsight may see it more favorably than did audiences of the late 90s. And speaking of that, it's now time for our honorable mentions. Okay, what are yours? For me, we have Power Rangers, the 2017 reboot. So not the, not the old one from the 90s. No, that one's cool too, though. <laughs> the Last Jedi, don't at me. Scream 4, and of course, Hook which got annihilated by critics upon its release, and it's my favorite damn movie of all time. bang a -rang. Uh, For me, I'd say it's the Michael Bay Turtles, both of them. Tootin' Me uh, Needle Teetles? Yes. God, no. Oh. Please don't. <laughs> the Star Wars prequels, uh, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and Amazing Spider-Man 2. My God, I feel safer. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's a bad movie that you don't really think is all that bad? Let us know in the comments below, or tweet your answers to us at OKThankYT. All of our other methods of contact and social medias can be found in the description. And don't forget to check us out on Patreon for some OK-ish rewards. We just posted an exclusive video today. Well, <laughs> it's Saturday when we're recording this. That's true. And our Wednesday live stream um, now has an awesome new feature. So awesome. You can call in and talk with us directly on the show. Because who doesn't want to do that? Or just, you know, leave a voicemail if we're not live at 573-575-OKTY, which is 6589. Nice. We'll see you there. Yeah, okay, thank you. No, okay, thank you. I thought we were going to do that together. Uh, Want to try it? Yeah. Okay. No, okay. Okay, thank you. But we count to three. One, two, three. No, okay, okay thank, thank you. you. That sucked. I, I agree. Just cut. Just cut. What if I just don't? Well, then this is going to be a long-ass video, and no one wants to see that.